Howdy. 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 My name is Gregory Gauze. I'm the head of the Department of International Affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service, which some of you might know is on the west end of campus. <laughs> uh, this is the third in our series of What's Next? pop-up policy discussions that we hold here on main campus to let folks know that we actually exist. And uh, uh, we're very happy to have you come out and visit us on West Campus for our activities out there. Uh, today's topic is, is a somber one. It's the uh, what's next uh, for U.S.-Saudi relations, for Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, after the killing of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, my own research interest is in the politics of the Arabian Peninsula and Persian Gulf area. And I'm joined by my colleague, Professor Aaron Snyder from the Bush School, who also has an expertise in, in uh, the politics of the Middle East, uh, particularly on political economy questions in the Arab world, both the Eastern Arab world and North Africa. So it's a pleasure for us to be here and thank you all for turning out. Uh, I just ask you, uh, as we're beginning, if you have any devices, put them on silent, uh, as uh, Professor Snyder and I have had, ha have done, uh, that would be great. Uh, we are uh, streaming uh, through Facebook Live, uh, so uh, behave yourself. <laughs> so, right. uh, the format is we're, we're going to speak up here for uh, hopefully no more than 10 or 15 minutes apiece, and then have at least 30 minutes, hopefully more, for questions. Uh, we're scheduled to end at 6.30, and people have uh, plans, I'm sure, so we'll end uh, promptly at 6.30. Uh, I'll kick off, and then I'll pass to Aaron. So I, I just wanted to, to throw three to general topics out. The first is, uh, who is Jamal Khashoggi and why was he killed? Uh, so Jamal Khashoggi uh, was a, uh, a journalist from Saudi Arabia. He, was, uh, he made his name in the 19, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, covering uh, uh, radical groups, uh, particularly the jihadist groups that were fighting in Afghanistan. Uh, against the Soviet Union's occupation of Afghanistan, and then uh, continued to fight a civil war in Afghanistan after that, including Osama bin Laden, who moved to Afghanistan in 1996, if I have my, my, uh, my chronology right. Uh, uh, Jamal wrote for Al Hayat, which was, uh, I think, the, the, probably the best international Arabic language newspaper at that time. And it's when I got to, to know him professionally from reading his, his materials. He then uh, came back to the kingdom and, and became a very prominent editor. He was the editor of, the, of uh, Arab News, which is the largest English language daily in the Middle East, uh, uh, headquartered in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and he subsequently went on to become a political advisor to the Saudi ambassador in London and then in Washington, uh, Prince Turkey Al Faisal. Uh, Prince Turkey was, uh, for many years, the head of, of uh, foreign intelligence in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Jamal uh, then went on to be the director of a, of a startup project, a new television station that was going to be broadcasting out of Bahrain. Uh, but he was fired after uh, one week because he put a Bahraini dissident on the air. Uh, he was then the editor of, of a domestic Saudi newspaper called Al Watan, the, the homeland, that, that uh, really did try to push the envelope in Saudi Arabia in terms of domestic political coverage. He was fired from that job twice and then brought back twice before he was fired a third time. But after he was fired that third time is when he became advisor to Prince Turkey Al Faisal. Uh, about a year ago, he, was, uh, he chose to leave Saudi Arabia and put himself in what he described as self-exile. I should say his English was excellent. Uh, he, he got his degree from Indiana State University and so knew the United States well, knew, knew, knew this country well, and knew its elite well. Uh, the, the journalistic elite of, of this country, when they were interested in Saudi Arabia or visiting Saudi Arabia, 
they would always call Jamal and they would always meet with him. Uh, and that was reflected in some of the coverage that we've seen. Some of the most prominent American journalists on foreign relations, the Thomas Friedman, the, the columnist for the New York Times, David Ignatius, the foreign affairs columnist for the Washington Post, both had long professional relationships with Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, about a year ago, he chose to uh, leave Saudi Arabia. He felt that he couldn't live in the country anymore. He was becoming increasingly critical of uh, the authoritarianism of the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, who is the, uh, the de facto, day-to-day -day executive in Saudi Arabia. His father, uh, King Salman, has basically delegated most decision-making to him on a day-to-day -day level. Uh, from uh, Washington, he then uh, joined the Washington Post and contributed uh, op-eds to their editorial page in which he was critical of the way Saudi Arabia was going. He was very supportive of the efforts to open up Saudi Arabia socially. He praised Mohammed bin Salman for uh, uh, changing the rules to allow women to drive. He praised Mohammed bin Salman for trying to open up the religious sphere in Saudi Arabia, but he was very critical of, of Mohammed bin Salman's crackdown on, on uh, any kind of political voice in the country, either from the Islamist side or from, if you will, more liberal elements in Saudi Arabia, not that they represent a huge social force in Saudi Arabia. Uh, was uh, the Crown Prince involved in this killing? I, I think there's no question that he was involved. Uh, the, the Saudi story on this has changed a number of times from uh, Khashoggi left the consulate and was alive and well, and what's all this? We don't have no idea what happened to him, to uh, uh, this was a rogue operation, right? to this was an attempt to uh, actually extradite, to, to capture Khashoggi and bring him back to Saudi Arabia, but it went wrong and he was accidentally killed to the most recent story which fr from the Saudi public prosecutor, which is that this is being investigated as a case of premeditated murder. Uh, now, uh, we don't know all of the details of who gave orders and when and how, uh, and I doubt we will ever know that with any certainty. But this is not a system where underlings take a lot of initiative on their own. Uh, uh, and thus, uh, undoubtedly, the crown prince was involved in some level, at some level, because it was people close to him who were involved in the, in the actual killing. Now, whether he actually said, go and kill this guy, I don't know. But he certainly, uh, uh, those people wouldn't have engaged in this uh, large-scale operation. There are 15 of them involved. Uh, without thinking that, that he had approved it. Uh, so what are the consequences for the Middle East? Well, it, this exacerbates tensions between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we tend to think of the Middle East these days as a Sunni-Shia conflict with Iran on one side and Saudi Arabia on the other. But what I think that the tensions between Turkey and Saudi Arabia over this event bring out is that there was an equally fraught relationship within the Sunni world, within the Sunni Muslim world in the Middle East, between Turkey, which is led by President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, right, who himself uh, came to power through democratic means, but has become increasingly authoritarian over time. Erdogan represents, uh, in general, a, 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 a strain of political Islam in the Sunni world that's very similar to the Muslim Brotherhood, which is an Arab organization cutting across the Arab states. It's populist, it's bottom-up, it's very politicized. Uh, whereas the Saudis represent, obviously, top-down <laughs> Islam. The official interpretation of Islam in Saudi Arabia, which we call Wahhabism, is, is very uh, apolitical in that it, it, it advocates right, complete loyalty to the ruler, although there have been People like Osama bin Laden have kind of, if you will, gone off the farm and advocated for the overthrow of the Saudi government. But uh, official Islam in Saudi Arabia is state Islam, 
and it's extremely supportive of the rulers. So the Turks and the Saudis have been in tension, and most, most obviously in Egypt, a country that Professor Snyder knows a, a lot better than me. Uh, the Turks were very supportive when a Muslim Brotherhood candidate was elected as president of Egypt in 2012, and the Saudis were horrified. And in 2013, when uh, the military ousted that elected president, the Saudis and some of the other Gulf states, the Emiratis and the Kuwaitis, uh, helped to support the coup effort with billions of dollars. So uh, there has been a geopolitical contest between Turkey and Saudi Arabia for influence in the wake of the Arab Spring. And I think that uh, President Erdogan has, has played the, this, this uh, incident, this tragic incident, uh, very uh, astutely. He has been the statesman, but he has allowed his newspapers to dribble out the leaks mm -hmm. about what happened there, keeping the pressure on Saudi Arabia. Domestically in Saudi Arabia, there recently 18 people were arrested for their uh, involvement in the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, a number of senior people in the intelligence services were fired, and uh, uh, a senior person in the Crown Prince's media operation was also fired. But the king appointed the Crown Prince to head the committee to reform the intelligence uh, services. Uh, there's been some speculation and some calls in the United States for uh, the Crown Prince to be ousted over this incident. I think that's extremely unlikely to happen. The Crown Prince is either directly or indirectly in control of all of the instruments of coercion in Saudi Arabia. He is the Minister of Defense, and so he is in charge of the Army, the Air Force, what exists of the Saudi Navy. Uh, he has appointed the the head of the National Guard, which is the kind of the domestic security force in Saudi Arabia, which could be a counterweight to the army in, in a political crisis, but the, oh, I think this went off. Okay. We still get, we're still okay on it? Sorry about that. Uh, he's, com he's appointed the commander of the National Guard, and he basically has appointed uh, the head of the Ministry of the Interior, which is the domestic police force and the secret police in Saudi Arabia. So he, in, in essence, has control of all of the means of coercion in Saudi Arabia. And also, I don't see a, a uh, coalition within the very large Saudi family forming to try to block him mm -hmm. in any way, although uh, things happen behind closed doors within the family. But at least publicly, I don't see that happening. Finally, the third topic, U.S.-Saudi relations. Uh, what's next for that in the wake of the killing of Jamal Khashoggi? So we get mixed signals from the Trump administration. The president emphasizing the arms sales and the economic benefits of relationship with Saudi Arabia, although the number he cites, $110 billion, is vastly exaggerated in terms of, uh, the president acts as if there's a $110 billion <laughs> arms deal. Uh, at, at, at stake, and that's not the case. Uh, we can talk about where that number comes from during questions if people are interested, but it's not $110 billion. Last year, the United States supplied, delivered, about $14 billion worth of arms to Saudi Arabia. Now, it's still a lot of money, obviously, but it's not $110 billion. Uh, on the other hand, the President has said repeatedly that this is horrible and we're going to get to the bottom of it all those things. We don't have any mixed signals from Congress. The response in Congress, both Democratic and Republican, bipartisanship is not dead, at least on this issue, mm -hmm. has been one of, of extreme criticism of Saudi Arabia from, uh, from people who have been very critical of Saudi Arabia for a while to people like Senator Lindsey Graham, who of course is very close to President Trump, who had been generally supportive of the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia. So I do think that once we, once we see Congress come back after the elections, whether in the lame duck session or in the new session that will begin in January, I think we're going to see some hearings. Uh, whether the Democrats take the House or, or the Senate or not, I think we're going to see some hearings in the congressional committees about the U.S.-Saudi relationship. But there are a number of long-term factors that, that keep the United States and Saudi Arabia in a close relationship. One, of course, is the president's strategy of confronting Iran in the Middle East, which the president has defined as his major goal for his Middle East policy. 
uh, and, and without Saudi Arabia, with Syria and civil war, with Egypt consumed with its own domestic problems, with Iraq weakened and a, a playing field in which this geopolitical conflict is being conducted, and Israel uh, being the most powerful military state in the Middle East, but unable to play into the domestic politics of any of these places. And that's where the conflict among all these countries, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, is being played out. It's in the domestic politics of these weak Arab states, Iraq, Syria, Yemen. Right? Uh, so without Saudi Arabia, it's very difficult to have a policy of containing and rolling back Iranian influence. Uh, the United States also has a dense network of intelligence and military and economic ties with Saudi Arabia that revolve, of course, around oil. And we can talk uh, in questions if people are interested about the nature of the world oil market and Saudi Arabia's role in it. Uh, but I, I think that it would be very unlikely to see a major shift in the American relationship with Saudi Arabia, despite the revulsion over the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, in the out years. Aaron? Oh, no. Segway for the, 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 a still more pessimistic take more on things. <laughs> Um, as Greg mentioned, uh, most of my research interests focus on the political economy of development in the Arab world, um, particularly in North Africa. And like most observers of Middle East politics, scholars of the region, uh, the last three months have been truly mind-boggling. Um, on November 2nd, we'll come up on the one, one month anniversary of the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, and there are a great deal, great many questions about how the international community should respond to what's happened, how the United States should respond, uh, and if anything, just from some of the comments that Greg has made and from some of the analyses you may have already seen as well too, there are no easy answers because things are complicated, and especially with the global economy, given how integrated uh, states in the region are with the United States, with capital markets in general, it makes it very, very difficult to respond to events like this. Um, really quickly, I, I want to talk just for a few minutes on economic reform in Saudi Arabia um, in general in the last couple of years and the Crown Prince's position within this. So um, in the last two years, the Saudi government has launched a program called Vision 2030. Um, there are many vision programs in the Middle East by regimes uh, throughout the region uh, that are essentially a part of diversifying each state's respective economies, making uh, economies less reliant, especially, especially in the case of Saudi Arabia, on oil, uh, enhancing privatization, expanding employment opportunities for their citizens, increasing uh, foreign investment more broadly defined too. So Vision 2030 was launched a couple of, almost a couple of years ago to great fanfare. Uh, there are a great many conferences, um, very optimistic, shining, opti um, shining PR, um, uh, portfolios, uh, programs online to entice foreign investors to come to the country, to encourage investment, uh, to showcase what the, what the government uh, envisioned um, as part of its development program until 2030. Um, and part of this is because Saudi Arabia has recognized that it needs to reduce its dependence on oil. Um, and here I think lies some interesting areas in terms of thinking about different pressure points potentially um, in this situation. Um, some of uh, the observers that I think are, are writing some of the smartest pieces on economic history, economic policy in the region, have really kind of pushed back about the, against this notion that there's no room or the, no leverage for the United States or for other international actors uh, to use with Saudi Arabia. Um, they'll say, for example, Saudi Arabia is too wealthy, too powerful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the arms, uh, arms sales issues, which Greg um, mentioned earlier. Um, and what they've suggested is that Saudi Arabia needs the United States and members of the international community uh, just as much as in some ways as they need Saudi Arabia. Um, and that's interesting to think about again in terms of, well, who's going to invest in the kingdom? If people become skittish because of what's happened in the last few weeks, it's potentially problematic to keep people coming to the kingdom. Uh, to be able to deliver on the promises that they've made to their own citizens over the last couple of years as well, too. Uh, but again, it's too soon to tell. So there are some, I think, um, uh, some analysts who've said this is potentially disastrous economically, financially for the kingdom. And I think it's still too early to tell. Um, I was mentioning to Greg earlier this afternoon uh, that the head of HSBC 
issued a report um, that was kind of looking at how Saudi Arabia has fared in the last few weeks uh, with investments, its overall econo economic um, figures, and has essentially said it's not been impacted in any significant way. And I think it's, again, too soon to tell. Um, there was a, an event that was, uh, I think, last week, Davos in the Desert. So it was a large conference meant to attract, again, international investment um, by some of the financial luminaries uh, of, the, of the global community. Um, and in response to a great deal of pressure uh, from human rights activists, from journalists, from activists, um, academics, and analysts as well, too, many of those um, CEOs of, of different companies decided ultimately to, to pull out. Um, and again, how much does that mean? How much does that actually mean for pressure for Saudi Arabia? I think it's still too early to tell, but it suggests that there's the possibility that there's room again um, to kind of, whether in closed circles or not, to have a discussion about how to make some concessions and how to have a discussion about uh, reform in the kingdom. Um, there also, at the same time, have been, again, um, a great deal of concern from activists throughout the region as well. Uh, there have been several pieces uh, that have been published um, that essentially say if there is no sort of reaction, whether from the United States, uh, from European states and others, then this more or less sends the signal or gives a green light to other authoritarian leaders throughout the region that they can essentially get away with doing what they like. Um, activists that have been profiled um, in the Washington Post and the New York Times, uh, for example, um, from Egypt, have said this is what's happened in the last month has a really chilling effect uh, and promises to have a deeper effect on civil society in the, in the weeks to come. Um, so several Egyptian activists who've been in exile since uh, the coup in Egypt have said, you know, we're, while, while we're based in DC at the moment, we travel a great deal as part of our work. and if we have to fear that we'll be assassinated or if there's another potential uh, attempt, um, this doesn't look good for civil society in, in the Arab world uh, more broadly. Um, and in general, I think that, you know, there have been, a, again, a lot of discussion about how difficult it is really, this question of leverage. What does that look like? Could the United States cut arms sales completely? Um, are there sort of economic levers that could be used as part of a discussion with Saudi Arabia. And I think that, in general, there's a, there's a great deal of opacity with this subject, and I think that we can get into this hopefully in the Q&A section as well. But for the, the Vision 2030 program that I mentioned to you, when this was launched and rolled out and the Crown Prince came to the United States and came to uh, different European capitals as well to talk about this program, he very much projected an image of a modernizing monarch who was very much about um, expanding employment opportunities for Saudi citizens, empowering women. Um, he had just um, um, signed a petition allowing women the right to drive in the country, um, reforming guardianship uh, rules within Saudi Arabia. And again, the optics of everything were quite good. And I think that very much um, after the assassination, many analysts who were in some ways seduced by this image had to step back a little bit and kind of, again, question um, what that modernization looks like. And so many um, activists in Saudi Arabia were pointing out that as these modernization efforts were unfolding, activists in Saudi Arabia, and in some cases the very activists that were on the forefront of pushing for women's rights were being arrested, among other activists as well. Um, in August, I believe, um, uh, Canada criticized this string of arrests and promptly um, Saudi Arabia expelled the Canadian ambassador, um, froze existing trade, recalled its Saudi students from Canada, and just dumped Canadian assets. And this was only in, in August. And again, this was a worrying sign that was happening again a couple of months ago too, again, what, uh, about the extent of what would be allowed um, with the freedom of expression in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so I think that there, from my perspective as someone who primarily studies Egypt, um, there are some worrying signs with this as well too. Um, in terms of thinking about how much is actually going to happen and what, what, what kind of actions the United States might, might take in this vein. Um, many of you might know that in 2013 in Egypt there was a coup in which President Sisi um, rose to power. And two months after that, uh, 900 um, protesters in a square in Cairo uh, were massacred. And the reaction from the United States, which has a very close relationship with Egypt, 
um, was from what most people would describe as extremely tepid. Uh, the response from the United States was that it was deeply concerned. And given the, the close uh, relationship between both countries, um, while there was a great deal of pressure to push the, the government to, to hold the, uh, the government essentially accountable, nothing really happened. The only, the only kind of uh, sanction or punishment that came uh, was a freezing of military aid for about seven months. With the knowledge for most people who work on Egypt that eventually that military aid was going to be restored. But what was important, and I think that interesting, and, and Greg mentioned that we can expect to, he to see some hearings in Congress in the, in the coming weeks and months, is that in the case of Egypt as well, too, active voices within Congress, activists as well, um, were very much instrumental, I think, in pushing again for challenging the nature of the relationship, challenging the extent of what the U.S. could do. Uh, and I think that that's going to be uh, really interesting to watch uh, in the months to come. Great. We have a little bit more than a half an hour, and uh, the floor is open for questions. Uh, just put your hand up, and we'll go from there. Mm. Not all at once now. Um, Dr. Rudd, I was wondering if you could talk more about potential weapons using like volatile oil markets to pressure Saudi Arabia. <coughs> right. So leverage, what, what kind of leverage does the United mm. States have? I think Professor Snyder made a very good point that, that if you look at uh, the Vision 2030 plan mm -hmm. of the Crown Prince. Uh, They're listening. <laughs> it depends on, on, on private investment, both foreign investment and domestic investment. Mm. And what we saw in 2017 was a, a, a real decline in foreign investment in Saudi Arabia and a lot of uh, domestic capital leaving the country, capital flight. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that the, the Crown Prince went through with the, the, the Davos in the Desert, the mm -hmm. Future Forum on Investment, I think it was mm -hmm. called, FFI, uh, is because he's looking to draw in that foreign investment. He's mm -hmm. not going to be able to, to change this economy and lessen its dependence on the oil sector without foreign investment, uh, or private investment, both foreign and domestic. And, and that's where he might have overplayed his hand, yeah. or at least temporarily, who knows. Uh, arms sales are, are a bit of leverage, uh, but probably not a huge amount of leverage. Uh, there are all sorts of interests in the United States, both corporate and, and, uh, and workers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, 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 the workers who work at Raytheon and Boeing and all these places, right? And Congress pe people, uh, you, you usually get uh, uh, very significant denunciations of Saudi Arabia in Congress until it comes time to vote on arms sales. Yeah. Uh, in which case they, they almost always go through. However, I think that where you might see leverage coming from Congress is on Yemen. Uh, even before the Khashoggi murder, there had been growing opposition to the American cooperation with the Saudi Emirati war in Yemen. Uh, and in fact, the last time there was a test vote in the Senate mm -hmm. on, on a proposal to cut American support. We give some amount of support to the Saudi air campaign in Yemen, mm -hmm. largely logistical, air-to-air -air refueling, <coughs> and intelligence sharing. Uh, American forces are not involved in, in that offensive. Uh, and sometimes American drones go after al-Qaeda and ISIS, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people believed to be members of al-Qaeda or ISIS in Yemen but not directly in support of the Saudi campaign, Saudi Emirati campaign. So uh, Congress came close, or at least the Senate came close to the last time to, uh, to cutting off that support. And I think that you'll probably see uh, a move in that direction out of, out of Congress when it reconvenes. Whether the administration will veto, whether the administration will push back, remains to be seen. So let's now talk about oil. Usually when mm. you talk about oil, it's the Saudi leverage over the United States, mm. right? Uh, Saudi Arabia is the third largest oil producer in the world and far and away the largest oil exporter in the world, right? The United States, Russia, and Saudi Arabia are the three largest oil producers in the world, the only countries that produce more than 10 million barrels a day of oil. And, and world production of oil is about 90 million barrels a day, I think. Mm -hmm. So those three countries, Saudi, Russia, mm -hmm. and the United States, basically account for a third of all the oil that gets, more than mm -hmm. a third 
of all the oil that gets produced in the world, right? So they're the, they're the three big giants in the world oil industry. Now, the United States can't act as a player in the world oil industry because we're not centralized, right? You know, every, everybody and his brother has, has fracked their ranch here in Brazos County, right? So, so we don't have a national oil company. We don't have the ability to say, okay, we're going to produce this much this month, but next month we're going to cut, and the month after that we're going to cut. Russia basically has that because all of the, of the uh, major oil producers in Russia, while not state-owned anymore, basically answer to the Kremlin. And of course, in Saudi Arabia, there's one company, Saudi Aramco, that is state-owned that produces all of the oil in Saudi Arabia. So the Saudis can raise and lower production levels pretty much at will, and they can affect the market that way, particularly given the fact the current, the current context is that in, in, um, in a week, mm. the United States is going to impose secondary and tertiary sanctions on buyers of Iranian oil, trying to drive Iranian oil out of the market as part of the, the strategy to put pressure on Iran. Mm. Uh, Iranian production has already gone down as, as, as buyers have moved away from Iran. And the Saudis, uh, the, the Trump administration is looking to the Saudis to increase production to make up for that lost Iranian oil. Now, if the Saudis don't do that, prices are going to go up. I mean, we've already seen prices go up in the last few months from maybe the low 60s towards 70. Now they've fallen back to around 65, West, West Texas Intermediate. Uh, so there's this speculation that the Saudis can use the oil weapon against the United States. In the short term, they can affect prices. But in the long term, uh, they would be uh, damaging their own interests here. Because if they push prices way up, <laughs> what's going to happen? Well, more people are going to frack their ranches and their farms here in Brazos County, right? Uh, and, 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 and you're going to get more production in the United States and elsewhere as prices go up, right? At $100 a barrel, you can find oil all sorts of places that you can't find oil at $60 a barrel, okay? And you can find all sorts of oil at $60 a barrel that you can't find at $30 a barrel. So the Saudis have short-term price leverage, but long-term, I, I don't think that they can strangle the market, so to speak. And, and we import very little Saudi oil, right? Not just because of the huge increases in American production, over the last eight, nine years. I mean, the United States oil production has basically doubled in the last mm -hmm. eight years. Uh, we can talk about the consequences of that for the environment mm. for Oklahoma, where they have an earthquake every other day. But, uh, but, you, the, but it's, it's, it's remarkable technologically mm. how United States oil production has, has increased. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Petroleum Engineering Department at Texas A&M University, <laughs> among, other, among, other, among, among other technological <laughs> innovators. Uh, but so they have some short-term leverage, but I don't mm -hmm. think that, that they have long-term leverage in this. And they would be, and, and the, the Saudi oil minister, who is an Aggie, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, Khalid Al-Fala, graduate of, of uh, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, our College of Engineering, uh, has said that you know, Saudi Arabia is going to be a responsible supplier of oil to the world market. So I, I think that, at least on the technocratic side, the Crown Prince would be getting quite a bit of advice to be very cautious about how he tries to use the oil weapon. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> yeah, all right, there we go. Yes? What was India's or whoever ordered the stint in opening the conflict? So what was uh, the Crown Prince who, uh, who uh, we agree was responsible at some level for this? Mm. For, for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, what was he trying to accomplish? I think that this is uh, a profoundly important question. And, and something that Professor Snyder said begins to get at, the, at what I think the answer is. Sure, I mean, there's a, a general desire by authoritarians to uh, cow the opposition, right? But there were lots of different ways you could have done that in this case. 
But Professor Snyder mentioned a, an incident that most Americans probably didn't even notice, and that's this thing with Canada. Mm -hmm. right, over the summer, the Canadian Foreign Ministry basically tweeted, which is where all important oh, political important. statements are. <laughs> uh, basically tweeted a, a relatively mild criticism of Saudi Arabia for the arrest of a number of the women activists mm -hmm. who had been pushing for the right to drive, and they got it, but then right before they got it, a bunch of them got put in jail. Mm -hmm. Kind of as a message that this comes from me, the government, not from you, mm -hmm. society, right? Uh, and, the, and the overreaction in Saudi Arabia was uh, incredibly puzzling. Yeah. They, they, they pulled Saudi students out of Canadian universities right before semester started. They even pulled patients who were in Canadian hospitals out mm -hmm. and brought them back. Uh, this is Sorry. the kind of action that happens when people let their personal feelings govern their <laughs> political decisions. And shows insecurity more than anything else, right. profound it, it, insecurity. Right. It shows profound insecurity mm. if you think that this was something besides mm. someone who has never been told no in his life. Right. <laughs> reacting in a way that was personal revenge. Yeah. And that's what I fear might have been behind the, the brutality uh, in the way that, that uh, Jamal Khashoggi was targeted. Uh, it, it, it just it bespeaks a sense that this guy is, uh, this guy has betrayed us. Mm -hmm. He's gone to Washington, which is our most important relationship. Mm -hmm and is writing in English negative things about us to affect our relationship with America. And publishing and, things in Arabic and as well. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then they, the, the Post, the would, post then, was, would, yeah. would publish Jamal's stuff in Arabic mm -hmm. as well. But I actually think the English might have been more important than the Arabic yeah. in this case. Uh, and, 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 you know, I'm putting on my, I'm putting on my, 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 my Saudi kufiya here, my, my Saudi <laughs> butra, right, uh, uh, and, and saying, and, and we gave this guy everything. He was an insider. We had given him mm -hmm. such important positions. And now look at the way he treats us. And it just, and this is my speculation. I don't have any evidence about this. But, but it bespeaks kind of a personal, a very personal reaction. If they had been thinking about the politics, they would have said, do we really want to create an incident with Turkey right now? Mm -hmm. At, at a time when the Syrian civil war seems to be winding down mm -hmm. and the Turks have influence in Syria? Do we really want to be exacerbating problems with Turkey at a time when we are trying to portray ourselves as mm -hmm. a place of, uh, of safe and secure investment, foreign and domestic? Mm -hmm. We want to have economic relations with Turkey, which is another major mm -hmm. economic actor in the Middle East, all going, going through its own economic problems right now. It, 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 it shows, it, it bespeaks a, a, either an inability or an unwillingness to think through the second and third order consequences of your actions. And to me, that indicates kind of a more personal, emotional mm -hmm. kind of reaction rather than a cool headed consideration of political choice. Which is, which is not what you want for your ally. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, when we understand what the relationship is between the, the US and the Saudi government or the US and, and the Egyptians, Things haven't been perfect. Human rights records in general in the region have not been anything to get excited about. But there has been, at the end of the day, an understanding. And I think that what, what happened in the last month has just upturned that completely. And I think even just for, for, for Khashoggi as well, what was also shocking for many of us was this is, again, as Greg mentioned, this was not a radical. This was somebody who was well known, um, well known within circles in Saudi Arabia, obviously. Um, and it's, it's, been, it's been extraordinarily puzzling. Well known, well known yeah. internationally. Well yeah. known in Washington. There was a. a did I see a hand there over here? There's a hand here. <laughs> okay, we'll get you. We'll get you. Oh, oh, Mary. Yeah. So, what does this look like for Saudi relations with Turkey? Okay, Saudi relations with Turkey. Yes. Well, uh, as I said, I th I think that that uh, <coughs> there was a a real tension between Saudi Arabia and Turkey in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Uh, with different visions of what Islam means for politics and who should lead in the Sunni world. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Turks are in bad shape, yeah. uh, although they've been kind of an economic miracle for the last 20 years in the, mm -hmm. United, in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, there's, they're going through a downturn now. 
uh, they need they need investment. They need Saudi tourism mm -hmm. is a big element in the Turkish balance of payments. Uh, so I think that's why Erdogan is walking this line, mm -hmm. right? He's gonna he's 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 talking to the Saudis. Mm -hmm. He talked to the crown prince. He talked to the king. He received the king's special envoy on this mm -hmm. issue, uh, but he's still trying to hold their feet to the fire. Uh, my guess is that at the end of the day, uh, the Turks and the Saudis, I don't know if they kiss and make up, but they, they make up, but they'll still continue to have a rivalry over the question of yeah. leadership in the in the region. Yeah, I have nothing really to add. I think it's it's a fascinating question. It's one that I've been really intrigued with the last few weeks. Um, because as Greg mentioned, the economy in Turkey is, there's no way of putting gloss on it. It's terrible. And so there's been a great deal of speculation in general about this issue over the last month. But one, one, um, one idea that's been floated by many analysts is this notion that um, Erdogan might be trying to use this moment to pressured the Saudis for some sort of financial support. In other words, and again, this is pure speculation. There's not, no evidence to support it whatsoever. But one kind of notion to kind of try and figure out what this relationship is like and how it might be made, this whole affair might be made to, to go away in some form, um, is that Erdogan supposedly has tapes um, from within the consulate at the time that Khashoggi was tortured and assassinated. Um, in the press conference, I think today, um, Sarah Sanders mentioned that President Trump, um, with the CIA, CIA director, listened to these tapes. Those tapes have not been revealed. If Erdogan wanted to share the tapes and make them public, he could. Um, so again, it's kind of, you know, to question kind of what information is being leaked out bit by bit through the newspapers, as Greg mentioned, and to kind of think about the bigger picture things as well, too, which is that Turkey is obviously has a very problematic human rights record of its own, amongst other issues. Um, Erdogan cares about his own power, as do other leaders in the region. He cares about the economic strength and viability of his own country. And if there's something, perhaps, that he's able to, some sort of a deal he might be able to effect with the Saudis that's instrumental and helpful, then maybe some aspects of this, this crisis can, can go away. But it's, having said that, I, I don't know what that looks like. Um, but that's one of the kind of more far off things that I've been hearing. Yeah, here. Hmm. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, basically, unless the United States ba uses this as an opportunity to go to the Saudis and say, look, uh, behaviors have to change, and one of the things that has to change is this clown mm -hmm. show with Qatar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I, I don't see any signals that we're going to get that kind of, kind of comprehensive American approach to the Saudis saying, look, you guys messed up. You messed mm -hmm. up big time. Mm -hmm. uh, here are the gar here here are the ground rules, mm -hmm. right? Regarding Yemen, regarding Qatar, uh, regarding the Turks. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to see that, but I I, I don't know if the administration is going to do that. And that's just yeah. it. I think that there's so many creative possibilities with this. I mean, yeah. this you know has been an idiotic issue <laughs> that's yeah. persisted for what, almost a year and a half. A year, over a year. Over a right. year now. Right. Um, between that, that issue, the extremely important issue of what many people think is a famine in Yemen, um, there are possibilities, again, different leverage points, again, that the, the administration can have. But the question is, is the leadership up to, having, up to that conversation? Um, is the administration up to engaging people who are experts on this region and the nuances of, these di of different dimensions of these avenues? And I'm not, I, don't, I don't feel confident that we're heading in that direction, but there is there is that possibility, but whether there's the yeah. political will I mean, to make I'd, that happen, I'd like is something to see else. the administration send a senior, very senior mm. American like James Baker, mm -hmm. who knows the king, who's worked with Saudi Arabia, who has the the, the gravitas, <coughs> really well respected, to, yeah. well respected in Saudi and, and across mm -hmm. the aisle, I mm -hmm. think, in the U.S. and and with a with a comprehensive set of talking points, mm -hmm. but I don't I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I would just say very quickly, I mean, what, what you asked is a question that I think most of the academics that I know that follow this issue closely, and particularly those in the human rights community, were really upset the day after the assassination, which is, is it not enough that most of Yemen is starving, that the country is, has been in an unnecessary war uh, for several years? Was that not enough to incite outrage from the United States? Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't. It hasn't been. Um, and I'm not, I mean, I, again, I'm optimistic that maybe this crisis presents an opportunity to change that dynamic. Um, but I'm not sure. And I, I think that, again, to, to ascribe any logic, whether it's, you know, how the Saudis responded to the Canadian tweet, to the decision to, to jail women's activists who were, again, at the forefront of trying to, or petitioning for women to have the right to drive, um, why? why? Um, and I'm not sure, but the, the question again about um, uh, why this suddenly and why this outrage and not over the situation of Yemen, which is one of the worst crises. Um, I think the UN is meeting in a couple of weeks to determine whether it actually qualifies as a famine. Um, there's a fantastic story in the New York Times this past weekend going into a great deal of depth about the dimensions and the effect that the famines had on the country. Um, uh, that's really, uh, I think, important to look at, um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Stalin, who knew something about mass killings, mm. famously said that, that a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. Mm. And I think that the fact that uh, Jamal Khashoggi had a, a wide network mm. of, of friends and acquaintances in the American elite mm -hmm. was uh, an important factor. And one can argue that that's mm. morally irrelevant. But I think if you want to explain why, yeah. I think that, that that had something to do with it. On the Muslim Brotherhood side, everybody knew that, that Jamal had, had uh, MD affiliations from his youth mm. and, and was sympathetic to Islamist political platforms, mm -hmm. although uh, certainly in recent years, and I, I would say in, in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, much more on the liberal side, I mean, much more on the Islamic Isla you know, Islamists should be able to participate in mm. democratic politics, mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it was not. It was not a big shock. I, I just don't think that the MV bit mm -hmm. was a major push on this. Mm. We have one here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you may have covered it before. I think. Oh, to. To capture the assassination, yeah. yeah. I just mentioned it briefly that uh, apparently, again, um, the president and the, the CIA director have listened to the tapes, I believe, maybe today or yesterday. The tapes were from the watch? I, I think it might have been from that, or from, I've also heard from f from surveillance that the I Turks thought, had. Yeah, I thought the Turks had bugged yeah. the consulate. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not I, sure. I don't and know I, yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah. I don't... I, so I had I read mm. something about an Apple Watch, and then it kind of fell out of the coverage. Because so I, just don't I don't know. have an Apple Watch, but I remember yeah. when this was gaining yeah. some traction, Timex. that yeah. someone <laughs> was explaining that it had to be synced a certain way, and thus it was impossible for it to have recorded. I, I'm not sure, but yeah. Does the U.S. have a playbook to deal with these kind of, you know, uh, guys? I'm sure we've dealt with a bunch of dictators. So, so is this any different from anything that has happened in our history? Uh, why are we even, to me as a very simple, simplistic engineering professor, I think that we should just put our foot down. There should be certain lines that certain people don't cross. And if you cross, you get whacked in the head a couple times. <laughs> and you fall back online. Why are we even, get, why are we spending so much of our capital trying to guess what some nitwit dictator's son is trying to do. You want to handle that I was going to ask you to jump on that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have enough time to go through a history of U.S. Uh, <laughs> dictator relations. 
So I, th I think yeah. that we've, we've had, you know, strong relations with plenty of dictators, yeah. right? Uh, and we just don't want them to embarrass us. Now, why the Yemen war is not an embarrassment and the killing of one journalist is, is something that, you know, we, we've discussed already and it, it might not no. pass, pass, pass a, a, a moral philosophy yeah. standard, but that's where we are. And I think that, you know, what you're going to see is if the, if the administration does anything on this, I think it will be uh, to maybe not smack them in the head, but smack them on the wrist and tell them not to do it again. And, uh, you know, there, it, it's problematic. We're the most powerful country in the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, we proved in Iraq that we're not so powerful that we can dictate the domestic politics of other places, even when we have 100,000 troops mm -hmm. on the ground. And we don't have that in Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia. Uh, he's got the troops on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be very, very difficult. You know, we, we, Lindsey Graham says, we shouldn't deal with this guy anymore. Okay, that's a clear moral position. But mm -hmm. if he's running Saudi Arabia, are we mm -hmm. not going to deal with Saudi Arabia? That's a, that's a harder choice mm -hmm. to make, right? Uh, maybe it's a choice we should make. I, I mean, I could make an argument that, that we shouldn't uh, break ties with Saudi Arabia. I'm, I'm more of the realist school of international politics and you got to deal with uh, the cards that are in front of you and uh, the cards that the other guy has too. Uh, but I also think that it's a perfectly respectable position to say we shouldn't deal with these mm. people. But if we say that, I think we have to back it up. We, uh, but, but we also have to be consistent, consistent, right? Should we deal with Sisi? Should we deal with Erdogan? Mm -hmm. Should we deal with, uh, I think we should deal with the Iranians, yeah. right? But mm -hmm. they're pretty nasty too. In all sorts of and the U.S. has never been consistent in the Middle East, right? Um, or anywhere. Or anywhere. Really. I mean, but it's I, true. But I think yeah. it would be very, yeah. very hard to find the great power that is consistent. Yeah. You know, s smaller countries can take more uh, m moral positions in foreign affairs. Hmm. Maybe Canada, as an example, because to be blunt, their position doesn't really make that much difference mm -hmm. going forward. Makes difference to Canadians, obviously, but doesn't make that much difference mm. globally. Uh, whereas the position the United States does. But to say really quickly, you know, after 9-11, the U.S. launched um, a pretty expansive democracy promotion strategy for the Middle East. Um, How's that working out? Not really well. <laughs> and it's, it's, it was deeply problematic for a whole host of reasons. But even those of us, including myself, who were very critical about the approach, the logic of it, would agree, I think, that even if it was problematic, especially in a case uh, of Egypt where most of those efforts were directed, there was never a democracy promotion program in Saudi Arabia, I should note, no. that even though it was problematic, the U.S. was not consistent with it, the application of its, of, its, uh, of its policy in Egypt uh, on human rights and democracy issues in general, people will, including myself, would acknowledge that even if it's not a success, even if it is hypocritical in many respects, at least it makes it more difficult for the Egyptians to disappear people. At least it makes it, there's more pressure on the regime. And that's in the context, again, of the, the, the strategic relationship that the Egyptians and the United States have, and also the one in a similar fashion that the U.S. has with Saudi Arabia, too. So some element, again, of like something might be imperfect, but there is some utility. Um, and there's a great deal of utility, I think, in keeping that conversation open and continuing to pressure in that vein. But to some extent, it just seems like a game where everybody's trying to figure out what I can get away with. Welcome to international politics. <laughs> and it, but it also yeah, makes yeah. perfect sense, right? So, so many people, to the questions about Yemen, um, some people are like, well, why should we be surprised by any of this? If there was never any sanction or punishment for Yemen or for any other things that Saudi Arabia has done recently, just in the last year, of course that emboldens the crown prince to do such a thing. Of course they know that they're important. And you know this idea that it gave him reason to kind of test those boundaries, so to speak. Professor Brown? So uh, we'll start with this 110 billion. I, I, mm. Do you want to? No, go, I don't jump we'll, in. We'll start with this 110 billion, mm -hmm. which is a figure that the president quoted during his visit to Saudi Arabia in March of 2017, and then it subsequently is quoted frequently. You know, we have 110 billion dollars. 
No, we don't, right? Mm -hmm. That 110 billion is uh, deals that were in the pipeline from the Obama administration, mm -hmm. plus a couple of, of deals that were uh, more concrete that the president signed in Saudi Arabia, and then a number of kind of uh, uh, promises to discuss future deals that might be worth mm. X number. X number. Uh, the, the arms industry is pretty concentrated. I couldn't tell you how many big firms are involved, but, uh, but they're extremely good at uh, dividing the work among plants in all sorts of congressional districts and states. Mm -hmm. And so there is rarely a state that, uh, that is left out of the bounty of some kind of, mm -hmm. of, 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 of the construct of, of the money for these mm -hmm. arms deals. And, and that's obviously very self-consciously done to try to, to maximize congressional support. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that, that it's, a, it's a, a vast exaggeration to think of $110 billion, right? I think we should think more in terms of like last year's mm -hmm. $14 billion. That's a lot of money, but it's not $110 billion. Uh, and I think that it, it, it's, would the Saudis go someplace else for arms? Well, they have, yeah. right? I mean, as far back as the 80s. The Saudis spent an enormous amount of money to buy British fighter jets instead of American fighter jets because they were worried about mm -hmm. congressional approvals. Uh, the Al Yamama project was at that time, and I think still is, the biggest arms deal in history. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, a lot of that money ended up in the pockets of British politicians. Uh, the Saudis had bought from China. They bought missiles from China in the mid-'80s without telling us. <laughs> Uh, they, they are talking to the Russians. They are looking to, and, and then they bought from France, and they bought from Britain, and mm -hmm. some from Germany. And the Germans are the only country that basically said, we're suspending arms sales and deliveries to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. But Germany is a relatively small supplier. Mm -hmm. uh, the French haven't, the Spanish haven't, mm -hmm. the British haven't, and of course we haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that uh, the political yeah. economy, the arms sales, is uh, its overall effect is exaggerated. Mm -hmm. The ability of the Saudis to find substitutes is real, although they're tied in in many of their weapon systems to American technology and American spare parts. And mm -hmm. it might be difficult, and, yeah. right, to, to switch out. But uh, and there are other uh, countries, arms industries that will that will sell without a doubt. But this is an issue I think is yeah. really interesting because again, also in the context of Egypt. Several years ago, um, uh, an Egypt analyst wrote a piece basically saying why we should never expect the U.S.-Egyptian relationship to change. And she honed in on the arms industry and the relationship with Egypt. And it was a very good analysis that kind of spelled out which states were most dependent, where the, the A1 Abrams tank parts were manufactured um, in Texas and Ohio, I think some elements in Alabama and a few other states as well too, and how this was something that no one in Congress wanted to touch. And so this notion of, well, you know, for many activists, well, we should cut arms sales to Egypt. Egyptians will tell you, and it might be the case in some ways in Saudi Arabia, the Egyptians will not be upset if you cut this. Egyptian citizens will not be upset because they never see this anyway. It's, the it's, impact It's of, American exactly. military aid yeah. that doesn't even go to Egypt. It exactly. basically goes directly to paying for the arms. This security. hurts. And so when, when, when you tell this to people who are unaware of this, they kind of the kind of jaws drop a little bit because they haven't, they haven't realized that, that connection. But the impact of that is that it hurts the domestic side of our economy more than it would ever would for the Egyptians and I think in some ways the Saudis. We have time for one more. Yes, here we go. So the Iranians. With a big box of popcorn. <laughs> 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 to be flippant. <laughs> They're enjoying the show. Yeah. The show. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Not to, 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 to push you off completely. I, I, I'm not sure, and I think that it's going to be one of many things to, to watch uh, in the weeks to come. So the, the Iranians mm. have their own problems, right, mm -hmm. with these sanctions coming up next week mm -hmm. and, and their own oil industry being hurt already by it. 
but geopolitically, they like the fact that the Saudis are under pressure. Mm -hmm. They like the fact that the Turks and the Saudis can't get along. If the Turks and the Saudis could have gotten along, they might have been able to get rid of Assad in Syria, mm -hmm. who is Iran's biggest ally mm -hmm. in the Arab world, or one of its biggest. It's got many Iraqi allies. Uh, but the Turks and the Saudis could really never get on the same page mm -hmm. about who to support in the Syrian civil war mm -hmm. because of their suspicions of each other. So geopolitically, it helps the, the Iranians if the Saudis and the Turks are, are on, on uh, uh, different sides. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, we'll get one more in that, and, and then everybody goes to dinner. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you think that Jared Kushner would play an important role in the decision of the Trump administration? Who? <laughs> no, no. <that's> <laughs> can, can you say it just a little bit louder? <laughs> <laughs> do you think that Jared Kushner uh -huh. would play an important role in the Trump administration decision? On this issue? Yeah. In some ways, maybe he shouldn't. This is not a great. <laughs> this is so. Many have talked about the close relationship that Jared Kushner, um, the president's uh, son-in-law, has had with the crown prince. Um, and again, there's a great deal of speculation in the last few weeks. But there have been kind of rumblings coming from the White House that President Trump is not happy with his son-in-law um, because he expected that relationship to bear greater fruit than the situation that we're in right now. Uh, and so. Um, and the idea that Kushner has mismanaged this relationship. If they were supposedly so close, why has this happened? Um, so who knows? Uh, who <laughs> knows, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but Mr. Kushner has had two important portfolios in the Middle East. I'm still waiting for the roadmap for peace. Right. One was which is coming he imminently. was going to be the one who was going to produce the peace deal yeah. between Israel and the Palestinians that would be supported by the Arab states. And that was part of his reach out to MBS, because he wanted Saudi support mm -hmm. in this plan, uh, which, of course, we, we haven't seen yet. Uh, it was Mr. Kushner who largely stage managed the president's visit to Saudi Arabia. President Trump's first foreign visit was to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Most American presidents, their first visit is either to Canada mm -hmm. or to Mexico, given the in, in enormously important relationships mm -hmm. we have on our borders. But you can understand why this president didn't choose either of those countries to go to first. Uh, so I, I, he had, Mr. Kushner put a lot of eggs in the Saudi basket. Mm -hmm. And it's not looking great right now. Mm -hmm. But as I said, I think given the density of the, of the, the networks of interest mm -hmm. involved, I don't see us going 180 degrees to a break off. Mm -hmm. And and while Mr. Kushner might keep a lower profile, the president seems to uh, have great confidence in him. His name has barely been mentioned in the last few weeks, which is telling-ish. But again, who knows? Uh, yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone for your patience and your attendance. And uh, mm. keep your eyes out for the next uh, what's next pop-up policy discussion from the Bush School. Let's hope that we can wait a few weeks before we have <laughs> any events that are of such so significance. Although, although, who knows? We have an election here next week, is what I understand. That's and right. uh, maybe we'll have some discussion of that. Thank yeah. you all for coming. Thank you.